Today, I want to reemphasize us to our vision for this year. The vision for 2021 is themed one more. And I believe that God is giving each of us an assignment to do one more. We're supposed to have one more conversation. We're supposed to give our relationship one more chance. We're supposed to have that talk with our spouse one more time. Didn't figure I'd get an amen on that one. <clears throat> We're supposed to, to go after our kids and have a, a parental conversation one more time. You, we, we are wanting to find out what our one more is. And as a church and a collective, we want to lead one more person closer to Jesus. We want to see one more soul saved, one more life changed, one more person baptized, one more person filled with the Holy Spirit. We want to watch one more kid come to know Jesus. Come on, this is the vision of this year of one more. And so I want to take today to talk through this idea and, and refocus us to ping back to center. And I want to start by telling you about a particular pastor and his dad. Rick Warren is a pastor in Southern California who pastors a church named Saddleback Church. Some of you may not have heard of that church before. But Rick's father, Jimmy Warren, was a Baptist minister, a church planner, and a missionary for more than 50 years. He mostly led smaller rural churches, but he was also a skilled carpenter. And one of his favorite missions activities was to construct churches overseas. Listen to this. In his lifetime, Jimmy built over 150 church buildings all around the world on every continent. After Warren's father learned that he was dying of cancer, he came to Rick and said, Son, I think I have one more church in me. Great dad, Rick replied. If you want to die with your boots on, go right ahead. He knew his father had never been the type to sit at home and watch TV. He said, where's the last church you want to build? And his father said, Siberia. A frozen tundra up north. And Rick now treasures the last photograph of his father that he has, which is him building a church in the forbidding climate of Siberia. And he's up on a roof in the snow in the dead of winter, and he's nailing the roof down to this church. Rick wrote this article about his dad. In 1999, my father died of cancer. In the final weeks of his life, the disease kept him awake in a semi-conscious state nearly 24 hours a day. As he dreamed, he'd talk out loud about what he was dreaming. Sitting by his bedside, I learned a lot about my dad just by listening to his dreams. He relived one church building project after another. And one night near the end of his life, while my wife, my niece, and I were by his side, Dad suddenly became very active and tried to get out of bed. Of course, he was too weak, and my wife insisted he lay back down, but he persisted in trying to get out of that bed, so my wife finally asked, Jimmy, what are you trying to do? And he simply replied this, got to save one more for Jesus. Got to save one more for Jesus. Got to save one more for Jesus. And Rick said over the course of the next hour, he said that phrase over a hundred times, got to save one more for Jesus. He said, as I sat by his bed with tears flowing down my cheeks, I bowed my head to thank God for my dad's faith. And listen to this. At that moment, dad reached out and placed his frail hand on my head. Picture, picture, picture this, this, this older gentleman who's lying on his deathbed and he's just uttered this phrase over an hour, I gotta save one more for Jesus. And something happened in Pastor Jimmy's mind. It's like the Lord shifted something. And he shifted it to change the phrase. And as Pastor Rick is kneeling, tears flowing down his face, listening to his father, Jimmy's hand comes over and he puts his, his hands on Rick's head. And he looks him in the eyes and he changes the phrase. As if commissioning Rick, he said, save one more for Jesus. Save one more for Jesus. Save one more for Jesus. And that shift took place as he realized, that's it. I can't save one more for Jesus, but Rick can. And so now I tell him to do the work that I no longer can do because I'm lying on my deathbed. And I simply say to him, save one more more for Jesus. Listen to me, church. 
Christ wants his lost children found. He, he, he wants us to go under that theme of save one more for Jesus. It's, it's, it's his great mission. And one day when we all get there and we stand before God, I want you to be able to look him dead in the eyes and say, mission accomplished. We did it. We saved one more for Jesus. This is the idea of our church. And all I want to do as a group of people is to reach one more person for Jesus. Listen, God has never made a person that he doesn't love. God has never made a person that Jesus did not die for. God has never made a person he did not create for his purposes. And even more wild to me, listen, God never made a person that he did not want in heaven. Every person who exists, God's looking and longing and hoping and believing that they would one day come into right alignment with him. And that's the idea of this church, that we would save one more for Jesus. Because the truth of the matter is, as morbid as it might sound, every single one of us will be lying in a bed years from now, and that will be the last bed that we lie in. And when we realize that I can't do it anymore, and we will, be, we will be forced to look for the next person that we could commission to do the work that we can no longer do so that they might be able to go out and save one more for Jesus. This is the exact situation that our character named Paul finds himself in. Paul nears his late 60s, and he's been arrested many times. He's been through hardship. But as he's arrested for the last time, he realizes that there won't be any more left in him. And it's interesting to me that Paul, much like Jimmy, Paul doesn't look to another person who's his same age. Paul doesn't call upon somebody who is a king or a political power of some kind. He, he doesn't call upon somebody with the profession of him who is running alongside him in this same season of life. <laughs> he writes a letter to a young, gnarly church planner named Timothy. Somebody half his age or less, he reaches out to the next generation. And when he reaches out to the next generation, he pens his final letter before he's going to pass away. And that letter is 2 Timothy. And because I feel like Paul is writing the last thing he's ever going to write to Timothy before he passes away, he's passing on the best he can, knowing his life will end in months from now. He's passing on the very last thing he can think of, some of the most important personalized texts that we have of him to the next generation. And our focus, as we all come into center on this, is what are we going to pass on to the next generation? What are the things that we are going to be able to say to the generation that comes up behind us and Paul has some interesting ideas that he wants to inform Timothy of before he passes away. Let me show you the scene here. 2 Timothy 4, verses 6 through 8 say this. For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time for my departure is near. Paul says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord... The righteous judge will award to me on that day, and not only me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. And then he continues to write to Timothy, and he says, Timothy, do your best to come to me quickly. He didn't ask for anybody else. He asked for Timothy. Do your best to come to me quickly. I want to see you one more time. I just want to talk to you one more conversation 
For Demas, because he loved this world, he deserted me and he went to Thessalonica. Christians has gone to Galatia and Titus to Dalmatia. And only Luke is with me now. So get Mark and bring him with you because he's helpful to me in my ministry. I sent Tychicus to Ephesus. And I love verse 13 because it shows us this older man as the season is moving from fall to winter. He left his, his jacket in the last city that he was in. He's forgetful, Paul. He's, you know, dealing with some memory loss. And so he just tells Timothy, when you come, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas and my scrolls, especially the parchments. You can just see the aging sage here as he's withering away and he's getting cold in this stone chamber that's buried underneath the surface. No sunlight can get in. And so he tells him to, to come to him quickly. And then he writes, I start at the end of the letter to show you the scene that we find ourselves in. And I want to take you to the very beginning of the letter to show you the faithfulness of Paul to Timothy. 2 Timothy 1, 1 through 7. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, in keeping with the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my dear son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve as my ancestors did with a clear conscience as night and day I constantly remember you in my prayers. Listen, the previous generation we need the prayers that you will pray for the upcoming generation. Paul looks to Timothy and he lets him know, I just want to let you know I'm praying for you. I long day and night to see you again constantly in my prayers. I'm covering you in prayer. I'm believing for your faith in prayer. I'm strengthening you through prayer. And he continues on. He's, uh, he continues on. He says, recalling your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. I'm reminded of your sincere faith. Listen to the generational faithfulness of his family, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you. That's the way that family generational faith can work. I just want to speak to the people who have kids right now that are sowing into the next generation. Listen to me. You're going to make it. You can make it. You just keep imparting the wisdom that God gives you to pass on to them. Silence all the negativity of the outside world because they're the next generation. And Paul knew three generations in Timothy's family and he said, I'm persuaded of something that I see in you. You sound like your grandmother, Lois. I see her mannerisms on you. I heard the prayers that she prayed, the faith I saw in her. In your mother, Eunice, I saw that same thing. You, you got her eyes, you got her heart, you, you've got a similar spirit, I'm persuaded. That faith that you heard them praying, you heard them teaching, you heard them stirring up, that same faith lives in you. Parents, listen, you're focused on the next generation right now, and I want to give you a quote by Andy Stanley. Your greatest contribution to the kingdom of God may not be something that you do, but someone that you raise. The greatest contribution to the kingdom of God that you might ever make may not be something that you do. You feel like, man, my life is not going anywhere. I don't know where it's headed. Listen to me. My children right now haven't made the profession of faith which would mean my children are not saved. So it, it matters in a great deal that we continually teach our kids that the greatest contribution we might ever make to the kingdom of God may not be something we do, but it could be someone you raise. Don't you give up because we need them. More on that in a moment. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. To the former generation, he said this. He looked at Timothy in his first letter, because Timothy was dealing with a lot of church people, and you know some church people were like, Timothy's too young to preach. Timothy, he's, he's, he I, you know, I was reading the scriptures while he was still in diapers. Uh, 
Oh, come on now, you know, you know, somebody's told you that before, right? Like, oh, son, but, you know, I was, I was changing tires, you know, before you were born. Don't tell me about that. Timothy's dealing with a lot of disgruntled people, and so Paul writes to him in his first letter just to encourage him in the faith in 1 Timothy. And he hears of all this, and he decides to give him a report. 1 Timothy 4, 12 through 14, Paul says, Ah, don't let anyone look down on you because you are young. Just don't even let them do it. Just, just, just pass it. Water on a duck's back. Just move on. Don't even let them. Don't, don't let anybody look down on you because you're young. Just set an example for them in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. Just lead the way no matter age or stage, he says to the next generation. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to preaching and to teaching. Do not neglect your gift, which was given you through prophecy when the body of elders laid their hands on you. I want to talk about what we're going to do with the next generation. The next generation is coming up behind us, and we have to instill some things into them. Our our church is expanding as we've moved into a brand new facility for kids who are K through fifth grade. But we have to think about the next generation. Some of us are the current, some of us are the former, and there's the next coming up, and all of us have a responsibility in this. And I want to say to you, if you're in the former, if you might be 40 and above, I want to say we need you at this church. We we need you as a voice inside of this people, this this group. And and, and maybe maybe that can't stand for every week because y'all are like, well, I've seen some of y'all 18 to 35 year olds. Uh huh. I know y'all need me, but y'all don't want me. You know, you don't listen. Worth a toot. Yeah, tweet that one. So let me just say it from me to you. I need you. I need you in this church. I need your wisdom. I need your experience. I need where you've been. I need where you're going. I need what you've lived through because some of y'all made it through Woodstock. Okay, if you, if you, if you survived all that, we, we'd probably be okay. Some of y'all got, y'all don't even remember the 70s. It's just a blur, you know. It's just gone, you know. We we need you. We need to know how you made it, where you made it. We have to focus on the next generation, but we have to unify all the generations to be a multi-generational church. 18 to 35-year-olds, don't be so arrogant that you can't submit to the wisdom of an older person. I'm just coming at you right there off the cuff, all right? We, We have to be able to bridge the gaps because we need one another and I want to talk to you about what this is and what this is isn't. Because the responsibility isn't, isn't personalized just yet. It's not personalized just yet. When I ask you this question, I want you to think of what you see in your mind. Do, do, do you tend to think of the church as an institution or as a movement? Do you tend to think of the church as an institution or as a movement? Oftentimes, when I say the word church, the picture that comes to our minds is going to be one of church buildings, steeples, auditoriums, stages with lights and all this. The institution. But when Jesus showed up, he said, listen, I came to move away from the temple. The temple was the institution and the presence of God was inside this temple and there was layers to the temple and what they called in the Old Testament, the Holy of Holies was where the presence of God dwelt. So it had three separate layers and inside the Holy of Holies, only the priests could access that. But when Jesus came about, he started preaching this really new way that was not institutionalized. He wanted to completely deinstitutionalized this thing. And what happened is when he went to the cross, literally, physically, the veil of the inner uh, Holy of Holies, it ripped of its own accord and the presence of God was released in all of the earth. And now what is the new temple is literally you and me. He said, that's my temple, that's my temple, that's my temple. You're my temple, you're my temple, you're my temple, you're my temple. I live in your hearts through faith. 
And literally, he said, there is no more institution. This is a movement. It's a movement of people loving one another who are loving God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength, loving their neighbor as they love themselves, and then turning the other cheek to even love their enemies. Oh my gosh, who wouldn't want to be a part of that? That sounds totally irresistible. But what happened, the church got started and we had a couple of hundred really good years where it was so personalized to the responsibility of each individual to take what they learned and to pass it on to somebody else in the current generation and the generation coming up, that it just broke out. I mean, it was everywhere. There were, there were house churches and there was conversations happening and a drift started taking place a few hundred years in back to the institution. And so the church became more corporate and it became more institutionalized. And literally, that's the antithesis of what Jesus was trying to create. He was trying to create fully devoted followers of him who would be the church in their, in their, their spheres of influence, relational reach zones, and they would go out as a movement. And that's what we have to come back to because that is what Jesus wanted to create. Because of that, you know, I, let me talk to the people who are not saved, who, who, who have not made a profession to follow Jesus, who are unchurched. We, we focus our church around wanting to reach people, and I'm not shy about that. I'm saying, yeah, we want to reach one more person for Jesus because I believe that your life will be better with him than without him, purely sit, uh, put. And because of that, you know, the church did good to kind of modernize the catalytic weekend experience. You won't see stained glass anywhere. That's a little expensive to insure, so we got away from that, thank God. It was a little more palpable for you. I don't wear a robe, you know. I don't have to do that anymore. I don't know if I would have, you know, if they would have asked me to. Come on, I'm wearing a hoodie today. I mean, we're, we're next generation out right here. It's next generation Sunday. I can get away with it. <laughs> Some of the Real religious people were offended that pastor up there wearing a sweater. He ought to look better than that, you know. But something happened where the, 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 the unchurched population didn't, didn't, still does not attract it because it shifted to institution and it has to reshift to movement. It, it has to go there where each of us feel the personal responsibility that one day we will take our last breath and we have to pass on and invest into the next generation so that they can go and make more disciples. The point of this movement is that, is that we would make more and better disciples. That's it. We, 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 we want more today than we had yesterday. And the ones we have today, we want them to be better tomorrow than they are right now. More and better disciples. That happens through ownership, not through like hope that more Lexingtons would just like flood into the church because. Well, we exist, so they'll just like appear. This is not magic. This is ownership. That it's, it's a personal responsibility to say, this is like a war we're in. And Paul's trying to say that. He's like, I'm done. I've got to save one more for Jesus. Wait, I can't. That's, that's the end of it. Save one more for Jesus, Timothy. Save one more for Jesus. I've got to pass on some things. So here it is. Two questions you might be asking. What do I pass on? And who do I pass it on to? What do I pass on? Where is the investment being made? And who do I pass it on to? I want to let you know this, talking about the next generation, you're hearing from so many people right now. This, th there, there are so many voices coming through my mouth right here on this stage. There's so many different leaders, men and women, who have made an investment into me that's being deposited into you right now, dating back to my childhood where my uncle would teach me things and my youth pastor's talking to you right now. You'd never know him. His name's Matt Britt. And he's coming through and, oh, I mean, he's all over this right here. He's just all over it. Professors all throughout college are talking to you right here who taught me what it was to pastor and to lead. People from Texas that you've never heard of before. People from California 
that invested into me, that taught me certain things. This, this is a composite investment, and I want to, like I said, honor is the spirit. And my father-in-law is coming through this microphone right now as we speak. I can't even talk about that. I can't even talk about that, but I want to show you the honor of the last generation into this generation. He's one of the first people I call when I need something. And when the older generation invests into the next generation, it's powerful. This is what it looks like. And so you're hearing from so many people right now because we need you to invest into the next generation. What are we supposed to pass on? Let me tell you. 2 Timothy 2 verses 1 through 10 says this. You then, my son, be strong in the grace that's in Christ Jesus. You then, my son, Timothy, be strong in the grace that's in Christ Jesus. The trait the next generation needs in their life is a new source of strength. In 2020, the suicide hotlines were up 900%. Because people are trying to get through the cataclysmic effect of COVID in their own strength. And it was, it was horrific what was happening. We're up, we're up 30% in depression rates just among 18 to 35-year-olds in, in a 12-month cycle. And Paul knew something. He said, you can't white-knuckle your way through this life. Those of you who are, who are Jesus followers, who have been through some stuff, who have felt some stuff, who have seen some stuff, and you know there's a power that you have to have access to that is called the grace of Jesus that activates something totally fresh and real in you. And you go, I don't know why. This situation should scare me to death. But I have this strange peace as I walk through this that I don't even care what happens on the other side. Do you know what I'm talking about? Those who have followed Jesus, you're like, oh, I've been through some things that I shouldn't have made it out of, and if it wasn't for the strength that I had in the grace of Christ on my life, had it not been for the Lord who was on my side, I don't know what we would have done. We have to pass that on and say, there is a power that the Spirit of God comes to live in you. He he dwells in our hearts through faith so that we could create a movement. And then he goes on and he says, and the things that you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses entrust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. Join me in suffering like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer. Similarly, anyone who competes as an athlete does not receive the victor's crown except by competing according to the rules. The hardworking farmer should be the first to receive a share of all the crops. If it was really hard for you to guess at like what all that means, you got to love Paul because I think he kind of chuckles as he writes verse 7 and he says, Reflect on what I'm saying, for the Lord will give you insight into all of this. You know what I mean? It's just kind of like a joke. He's like, I got too much to say. I can't unpack all that. You'll be fine. Just pray about it. And so this is what he's saying, that the teaching of Christ has been passed from Christ to Paul, and next Paul passed them to Timothy. Timothy is then to entrust them to other faithful men and women who will in turn complete the cycle and entrust them to others. It is the next generation that we are constantly investing into. And then he says, remember Christ Jesus, raised from the dead, descended from David. This is my gospel for which I am suffering, even to the point of being chained like a criminal, but God's word is not chained. We have got to give them endurance through suffering. No one who, 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 who's serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs. Join with me in the suffering like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. We, we got to hear that some stuff's coming. And we have to be able to endure the things that are coming. There's this weird kind of theology that made its way into the ranks of modern Christianity. Of come to Jesus and you will never have a single issue the rest of your life. And it preaches good, but it lives bad. Because the problem is, is that within three to six months, that person comes to church and they're like, hey, you lied to me. Tell me about all this that's happening in my life. I didn't know this was coming. And we have to be more truthful and honest in saying, listen, 
Being saved doesn't take all of the issues out of your life. It gives you the strength and the endurance to face all the issues that you will find in life. That's a new source that you can have endurance for as you walk through it. We have to pass that on. Maybe my favorite one of all is verse 10. He says, Therefore I endure everything for the sake of the elect that they too may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. He says we have to have a focus on reaching and loving people. He says, I endure all of this for the sake of those who would say yes to Jesus. I don't know who that's going to be. I don't know where they're going to come from or what's going to happen. I endure all this as a focus on loving the people who are part of God's church. And I don't know who that is, but I just want to continually give them an opportunity to say yes to Christ. I remember growing up, we would be, we'd be, we'd be in the kitchen. It's like 6 o'clock at night. We're out of school. Uh, you know, mom and dad are home and they're making dinner and there's music playing and mom's putting something, you know, together. And I'm from Alabama. My mama can cook. I mean, it, she can throw down in there and we're making food and I'd hear somebody knock on the door and mom would say, oh, oh, honey, go get it. Whoever it is, just let them in. Come on, just go open the door and um, somebody's at the door. So, so son, go, go handle that. And I'd open the door and it didn't matter who it was. Half the time, I didn't know who it was. And they, they, they'd come in, and mom would be like, oh, that's your Aunt Cindy from, you know, it's twice removed, second son and daughter of, she lives in Florida. Oh, come on in. I didn't even know you were coming. Hey, take your coat off, stay a while, make you a bowl of chili. We're going, and they'd just be there for like three or four hours, you know, and you're like, are you ever going to leave? You look up, and you're like, Mom, I'm going to bed, you know. It's a, Anybody grow up like that? Like you didn't know who was coming over at, to the house at night. You, you, it, it could be anybody and everybody. Now in 2021, you're in the dinner, in the kitchen making dinner at 6 o'clock at night. Kids are home from school. Y'all are getting down with the music. And somebody knocks at the door. Shh. Get down. Get down. Hey, catch the lights. Don't you open that door, son. You get out. They'll leave in a minute. They'll be gone. Go to the back bedroom, peep through the blinds, see if they're still there. See whose card is first before we decide if we want them in or not. Oh, you know, we, this is how it works right now. You know, we've shifted a whole lot in the last couple decades of, of that. Hey, yeah, come on in to, to, man, don't let anybody in at any point. You know, I think what's happened inside of our family culture is that it's mimicked the life of the church culture where used to you would let anybody into the doors of the church, whoever it is, whoever they are, no matter where they've been, whatever past they have, come on in. Hey, how you doing? Welcome. And has the church gotten to the place where they're like, oh, why are you here? Shh. Can, can you just, can you just, no, don't let them in. Don't let them, don't let the unchurched or the unsaved people, I mean, God forbid that people who need Jesus come to church. Have we, have we gotten to the point where we're, we're like, oh, those unsaved people just act so unsaved? <laughs> They're not saved. They have no responsibility to act anyway. Why are we upset with this? Of course they're going to do unsaved things. Woodstock in the 70s. We forget who we used to be and we think that people are supposed to be who we are today when they haven't decided to follow Jesus. Listen, if we want to have a one more culture, we have to kill the no more attitude. You know, do, do you pick up what I'm putting down? We have to pass this on. We have to pass this on that, hey, listen, Anybody and everybody at any point is welcomed. And if you don't know Jesus, you're welcomed. If you do know Jesus, you're welcome. My mama had a phrase going up, the more the merrier. And the church left that and said, if you're saved, we love you. If you're not, get away. Let's huddle for warmth and get all of our people together. Insulate until we all die and go to heaven and forget everybody else. That's not the heartbeat of this church. 
that it has to be that we are reaching out and going, who can we help? We have a personal responsibility to make a movement happen. And we have to do it through the people around us. And we have to show the other people coming up, our kids, the people in the, who, who, are, who are children and, and teenagers and adolescents and young adults, we have to lead the way, all of us, in showing what it's like to pursue relationship with people who don't think like you or look like you or talk like you because the institution of the church of just like hope it happens, that's not going to work. We have to be intentional. That's what the former generation in Paul's world was passing on to the new generation of Timothy. Is he was like, hey, you endure all the stuff because all of heaven celebrates when one person comes to know Jesus. Is this not gospel? Jesus said that I would leave the 99 to go after the one. And when I get the one, I would re-emerge with the 99 and I'd bring them all together. This is exactly what we want. But then it gets strange because people get this bug of like, okay, I want to do this. You get into worship services and you pray and you're like, oh yeah, God. And you're like, God, use me. God, use me. I'll do whatever. I just use me. And three months go by and you're like, oh, I just feel so used. What you, what you think was going to happen? Listen to me. I, we don't need perfect people. We need available people. You don't have to be perfect to serve the church. You have to be available. And we have this weird thing where people who stay church to stay church long enough of like turn away from everything that you've ever known, relational history with anybody and everybody, and then make it all about you. I'm just not getting fed at that church. I'm just not, I'm just not meeting my needs and where I'm at. So I don't want to serve. It's just not my season. It's my season to rest. Like, so you're the only person in the history of ever that gets to sit out on the sidelines and rest and get well before we play the game. We're playing hurt every weekend. I preach hurt every weekend. I'm just exposed. I'm not saying that to make you feel bad. I'm not doing that. I'm saying, look, God can develop you and He can work through you all at the same time. That, that nobody is going to ascend to perfection, get it all right, and then serve the church and then be useful in God's kingdom. God's literally like, no, 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 I use imperfect people every single day and I just need people to step up and say, God, I'm available to be used by you and I'll work on you and I'll work through you all at the same time. That's the beauty of God. And the next generation is so important because we're told that we don't know when the next generation Sorry, we don't know when the final generation will be here on earth. We don't know. We don't know when the last generation will live. But we are called to pass on a level of faith to that generation. This is key. For the persecution that we know they will endure. People are like, oh man, the world is in shambles. I'm like read Revelation we know how this story ends so we know that they whoever they is will endure it so we have a responsibility to create a movement passing on as much as we can to the next generation so that whenever the last generation lives they'll have a faith that they saw us have setting an example for people in love, in faith, in purity, in conduct, in speech. Am I making sense? And that's the onus on every believer. And, and it really, it, it doesn't matter how old or how young you are. You're looking for the person who's one season behind you that you can speak into. That's really all there is to it. Some of you, have a larger capacity than that you can speak into multiple generations multiple in fact I'm praying actually that through this that somebody would be like man I'm compelled to be a part of our kids ministry after this 
I'm, I'm compelled to, to serve and to watch kids come to know Jesus and to get in there and to help lead, disciple, and steward their lives. And that's totally amazing and acceptable. That There's some people in here, I really believe, that are going to say, hey, that's, that's what breaks my heart, and that's where I want to be involved and serve. If you feel too old to serve in the kids' ministry, you're not. You just have more experience. That's all there is to it. Could you stand with me? My pastor from Dallas, Texas, he had a, a moment. It was like a, a vision of from God what his future might look like. And so in this vision, he sees himself preaching on a stage and there's just an audience of people in front of him thousands of people and as he's preaching people are coming to know Jesus people are getting healed and delivered and people are worshiping it's just amazing and the view is from the back of his head out to the audience the view shifts to a helicopter view looking over his head down onto the stage and he notices something unique in the vision that there is a square hole cut out in the stage behind the pulpit and he's standing in the square hole and as the 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 view goes down into the hole he's actually standing on someone's shoulders and as he looks it's his dad that's got his ankles and he's praying for him and he's sweating and he's crying and he's grimacing so that he would be successful in the job that he's doing. And the Lord spoke to my pastor and said, Scott, that's going to be the picture of your life. I want you to stop worrying about your stage ministry and start worrying about your shoulder ministry. Because I want the next generation's floor to be your ceiling. That you should build this up so that we can pass on a spiritual inheritance to every generation that follows. We talk about inheritance as if it's just financial. Can I tell you, there is a spiritual inheritance that we can give to the next generation. And I want to have this church be a church that imagines the possibilities. What if we all were people who said, I just want to hold somebody's shoulders. I want, I want to support the next generation in what they're going through. I want to stand in the gap and I want to be a person who helps, who supports, and makes them successful because the next generation needs the current generations, all of what they've been through to give to them to know how to make it in the future. That's the heartthrob of this church. With every head bowed and eye closed today, I'm praying that God would give you your assignment. The sermon's title is simply one more with a blank. I'm going to ask that you make up your own title and you fill in the blank. God might be saying, have one more conversation. He might be saying, parent one more child. He might be saying, talk one more time. Lead one more person. Whatever it is, I'm just going to allow you to fill in the blank. And the call to action today, I believe, will be experienced through prayer and worship of whatever it is that God has for you. But I would love to pray for anyone who wants to make their heart right with the Lord, who says, hey, I just want to come into right relationship with Jesus today. Because that's the point of all of this. Paul to Timothy, Jimmy Warren to Rick Warren, that there's a man named Jesus that we're all passionately wanting to know, love, and follow. And maybe that's you and you're saying, that's me, I'm the one today. And, they, and if you want to come home from a spiritual perspective, I want to just pray with you and know who we're praying for. If that's you, would you just raise your hand? Thanks. Is there anybody else? God, I thank you for what you're doing in this service. I pray that you would speak to every heart, every life. Thank you for those who are coming home today. 
Thank you for those who are getting new assignments today. I pray that you would use every single person. I want us to respond in one of two ways. We have a prayer team in the back of the room that you can pray with. And if you would rather not pray with them and you want to stay at your seat, that's fine. We're going to sing a song of worship. But I'd love for you to choose one of two. And the prayer team would love to pray with you if you would like to receive prayer in this moment and partner with them in prayer. Come on, let's worship together this morning. You go before us, nothing can stand against the power of our God. Thanks for watching. Head over to vividchurch.com so that you can stay updated with all things Vivid Church. Join us in person or online for one of the services so that you can be a part of our Vivid Church family. But don't stop there. Please share this video so that we can help other people live the vivid story that God has for them. Thank you.